think you can. Um, um, hello, my yeah. name is Andrew Gordon. Uh, I am a stay-at-home father and woodworker. I enjoy long walks on the beach. Um, uh, the wrong presentation, Andrew. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I'm Emily. I do run an Etsy store. Um, I make all kinds of things with laser cutters. Um, for my Etsy store, it's mostly laser cutters, um, as well as uh, doing some casting, uh, resin casting. But we are here today to talk about making. Uh, so what is making? Making is simply the act of creating something. Uh, it's much broader than other terms like engineering or artistry in that it doesn't get into specifics of what or how or by whom. Uh, because of its general definition, makers can sometimes struggle with defining what they do. Um, and it's a simple explanation of something that to them is very, to us, is very personal and, and consuming. So you're probably thinking, um, I like to make things. Does that make me a maker? Um, if you want to be, sure. You need only the desire to create something new and the will to follow through with it. Okay, so if making is something that many people do and have done you know, probably for ages, what's the big deal? Why are we talking to you about it? Why do Emily and I spend 40 hours a month of our precious time working toward more people doing it? Frankly, uh, we believe it's important, really important. So important that we do all this work for free and honestly, we'd put in more time if we could. So um, why, is, uh, it why is it important? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, making reinforces and rewards good and noble values like creativity, expression, ingenuity, collaboration. These are some of the greatest facets of our own humanity, and they are best expressed and enhanced when we're solving a problem. As a parent, some of the most beautiful and happy moments I enjoy are when my children exhibit these values. Making has a significant role to play in education and lifelong learning. It can inspire young people to excel in the subjects of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, which is collectively known as STEAM. You may have heard it referred to as STEM, prior, but they have broadened that to include the arts, which I think is an excellent thing. Um, and it also connects their learning to real world relevant problems. Teaching through making has been shown to reverse a recent trend in decline in student engagement. Uh, on the flip side, it can also help those much further along in life keep physically and mentally active on top of giving a new purpose to life. Um, I know that I make a lot more now in my 50s than I did Young, when I was younger. <laughs> um, third, uh, making promotes innovation in manufacturing and product design. The modern maker movement makes accessible the kinds of tools and environments that used to be reserved to research departments of large companies and niche homebrew learning groups. Maker spaces and DIY learning resources make it much easier for an aspiring entrepreneur with a great idea to develop and prototype something unique in a way that, is, that was impossible just a few decades ago. Making also promotes individual and local entrepreneurship as well. For a long time, American consumers moved away from local artisanal goods in favor of cheaper mass production coming from overseas. That production was uh, ultimately outsourced with, to countries with less regulated, more socially costly methods of manufacturing goods. We've all heard the horror stories about how our phones are made, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, and now we're seeing a swing back from that as people look to source an increasing number of goods from local, smaller, responsive and ethical makers. And finally, uh, makers can become an enormous asset for solving big societal challenges. Making on a small scale allows for addressing issues that are often pushed aside for bigger or more common problems or problems perhaps slowed down by politics, political inertia, corporate inertia, or even just greed. We'll talk a bit more about some examples of these later, but for now, let's take a look at one of the neat tools you can find in a makerspace, um, microcontrollers. So um, I'm actually gonna be talking about two things. I'm gonna be talking about microcontrollers and small board computers or single board computers. Um, we'll talk about the differences in just a moment. For now, microcontrollers are basically um, a small processor built onto usually a larger board so that you can access input and output from that processor. 
Um, they come in lots of different form factors. They're very easy to power, very easy to code, very cheap and easy to use. Um, and ultimately they're not that powerful. Um, they are very good at doing one thing and doing one thing pretty well. Um, examples of what you could do with a microcontroller, and I'll, I'll be showing you one in just a moment, um, are usually like embedded projects that take in data and then do something with it. So you could have like a little display that pulls weather information, A, from you know your own house or from the internet and then displays it to you and tells you to wear a coat today. You can build a data tweeter for your house that says, um, oh, you know, there's a lot of moisture in your basement. You should probably go check that and it tweets at you. Or you can have one that says, oh, it's time to feed your cat or it's time to water your plant. There's ways to do simple security with microcontrollers. Um, you can have things that sense whether someone's moving in your house, or you can use an RFID to unlock your front door. And you can even do a lot of basic robotics. Quadcopters are the most popular probably, but um, a lot of little robots don't need much in order to do the things they do. It's just more complex programming and taking in information from the outside world and turning it into movement or turning it into action. On the other side of this, um, there are things that you're probably used to seeing right there. It's a Raspberry Pi. Um, they're called single board computers. And they're basically like tiny computers, like we're all using right now to be on uh, Zoom, like you would use to write up a report. They can actually do all of those things, but they're designed to um, give you access, again, to inputs and outputs so that you can take in data and send things out um, and, and put out data. But usually they have much more processing power and tend to be more user friendly to someone who's trying to maybe interact with it. Like let's say you were to make a um, DIY home assistant. Um, usually you can, you can create user interfaces that people can interact with or you can process voice commands on a single board computer that you couldn't do on a um, microcontroller because it just doesn't have the brain power to do it. You can also host file servers, web servers, um, game servers. A lot of people host micro, um, Minecraft game servers on Raspberry Pis. Um, you can host um, all sorts of network diagnostic tools, including firewalls that make it so you don't get advertisements on your home network. And even shop kiosks and displays at airports are usually powered by small board computers. Uh, I'm going to show you now. Hopefully we can um, do this. Would you be able to pin my video there, uh, Ken? Am I pinned or am I not? Okay, you're, what, you're, what can I, what do you want me to do with your video? Can you make it so, um, you can right click me and hit pin video. That will make it so that my video shows up basically is, the main, uh, might say spotlight or spotlight maybe that's it um, um i'm not quite sure what you're asking me to do but i see your banana there all right well if i talk it'll show up as the main video so oh, it's main, okay i see what you're saying yes i can pin that to a spotlight for everyone there you go there we go. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I have the banana here for scale. I wanted to show some small board computer, single board computers. You can see they tend to be larger than the um, microcontrollers. Um, I wanted to show off, I guess is probably the best way to put it, um, what you can do with microcontrollers and kind of the neat form factors they come in and how they can be designed specifically around the task. So you can see they, they go all the way down to something the size of a micro SD card that can take in just a few little inputs and put out um, just a few little commands into the into various other devices, all the way up to something big like this or even bigger that has built-in pieces to control robots and servos, um, has capacitive uh, panels that you can literally just touch to receive an input, um, has a massive power source for powering large um, servos and motors. There's ones that have built-in Wi-Fi capability, ones that are designed to be used with just alligator clips for rapid prototyping. Um, and there's even ones that are designed to be kind of more fun and silly. This is something that you can turn into either a badge or as you'll see in a moment, a really weird eyeball project. 
<laughs> single board computers tend to be blurrier generally. Um, that's something most people won't tell you, but uh, there we go. Single board computers tend to be bigger because they actually house a full computer on them. This is the eponymous Raspberry Pi. Um, you can see it actually has an HDMI out. You can plug it into a television and use it like a computer. It has USB and internet. And it can do everything a computer can do, albeit generally slower. Um, people tend to put them in enclosures like this. And other companies make ones too. This is called a BeagleBone Black. And this here is called a pocket chip. It's actually a small computer that you can use just like this. It's quite cool. Two projects I wanted to show off really quick that you can do with these before we get back to our talk is <laughs> Daphne over here, um, which is kind of like a Halloween decoration gone a little overboard, but Daphne uses just a regular microcontroller. So the kind of dumber, less clever devices. And you can see it's got a little eyeball. It has a screen that it's able to put out images on. In this case, it, it has an eyeball that moves around when it detects movement in front of it from this input. So very simple, taking in an input and then putting it out, sending out an output, in this case, some images to a screen. This is actually a much larger device that I built for my son using a single board computer, these smarter kind of more advanced devices. Um, it, is able to download information from the internet, is able to upload information to the internet, it processes and records sound, it also outputs sound. He uses it, my son uses this to um, record messages for his grandmother and then listen to messages that my grandmother sends back to him. Um, I'm, I brought this one out specifically because it is not working. Something that is really useful to know if you're trying to think about a project and trying to decide between these two things is that a single board computer is just your code and the device. Um, anything else is really, it's not gonna break anything. It's not gonna um, make anything work better. This, a single board computer is just like your computer at home. It's reliant on an operating system, tons of different pieces of hardware and software all being up to date and communicating with each other properly to work. So when this received a small update, it broke and now it doesn't work and I have to do a lot of work to get it working again. Whereas this will never receive any updates. It will never change. It just takes the code I put into it and does what I tell it to do. And that can be quite useful. So if you have the opportunity, try to use a smaller board, a dumber board, because it can make your project a little more reliable and a little less uh, annoying. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna stop here to ask any questions about single board computers and microcontrollers before we go back to our exciting talk about maker spaces. Yeah, Andrew, I have a, a question. Sure. Uh, um, I noticed that some of the microcontrollers have different shapes like that uh, circular ones and stuff. Maybe you can address um, why that is and um, sure. And what their yeah. particular the uses are. The standard one you're probably used to is called an Arduino and it's about this size and shape. Um, Ones like that are mostly designed for hobbyists to have maximum access to as many of the little pins that come out of the device as possible. As you get kind of more advanced, you tend to make things smaller because the enclosure can be smaller. The whole product can ultimately be smaller. Um, there is a massive trade-off for that though. Uh, what you'll see if you look at say this or this is I have all sorts of little holes in it each of these holes is a point where I can access what's called a pin or an input or an output. So I, the device can take in some sort of information or put out some sort of command or information through each one of these holes. The smaller the device, the smaller those holes get and the harder they are to work with. But um, this one actually only has a total of five pins that it can take in data from um, or put data out through. Um, but if I wanted to make something that fit inside of a ball cap and maybe made the cap light up or when it rained, made it talk to me, something like this would probably be able to do it and would be much smaller and require a lot less power to run. There's also a few, this one is rounded so that again, alligator clips won't touch each other while they use it. So you can kind of mess with it without having to do any soldering or know how to do any wiring. You can kind of just play with it as a hobbyist. 
Um, and then ones like these that tend to be these kind of smaller rectangles um, are just large enough to fit these chips on them, which are actually Wi-Fi capable chips. Um, otherwise, they would be as small as they possibly could. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm muting here. Um, yeah, I thought um, you might um, mention that some of those are uh, different shapes for um, uh, wearables. Um, and um, so I just, you know, look, yeah. if you wanted, yeah, the, the alligator clip thing was interesting. I didn't, and I didn't know about that before. So thank you. Yes. Oh, there, there's, for each one of these that you see, there's 10 more of different varieties and kinds to solve a sort of need that um, is popular. Wearables is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, and there are, this one um, has it, but this one has lights built into it. A lot of wearables actually have lights built into them too. So you don't have to code separate things in order to put like a nice display or a nice shining light on something that you're wearing. Okay, anyone else? Awesome. Maybe we can get our slideshow back up now. Walking back over to my computer. I definitely <laughs> want to see that. I want to see that eye blink on that head though. That's that's cool. Oh, it, it was real creepy. We had it up in the old maker space and it, uh, when you walked in it, mess with you. It's kind of, <laughs> yeah, and it's hard to see on, on uh, the camera, but it definitely shows up in person. Um, I have a few other, uh, microcontroller projects I'll show off later when I'm up with my laser cutter and I'll show you how you can use these tools together to make some really cool cool things. So we've talked about making and why we think it's important and what we're really here to talk about is the modern maker space and make the modern maker movement. Um, the modern maker movement began in Germany about 25 years ago with a hacker space called Seabase uh, opened it was a place where programmers could meet and share ideas and work, and no matter who they were affiliated with. Um, following this, a lot of other hacker spaces soon sprouted up around the world. And the goal of these spaces was to quote unquote hack technology to make it do things it wasn't meant to do. Uh, there were a lot of experimental instruments that came about out of hacking electronics to make them make weird noises, um, all kinds of things like that. Uh, art. A lot of guerrilla art was also tied to these early hackerspaces. Uh, over the years, the price of maker aimed tools like 3D printers, desktop laser cutters, and CNC routers became more and more affordable, and hackerspaces naturally evolved into maker spaces. Um, the terms are basically interchangeable now. Uh, and they both boil down to a community operated workspace where people with common interests can meet and socialize, and most importantly, collaborate. Um, their interests are often in computers, technology, science, and digital art, but can also include a lot of other disciplines as well, like sewing, fabric, um, weaving, spinning, painting, um, cooking, really like all kinds of, of making, ceramics. Uh, so that was 25 years ago. Where are we now, Andrew? Um, well, seven years ago, President Obama held the very first White House Maker Fair and announced the Nation of Makers Initiative, which pledged funding to STEAM programs, showcased some maker spaces, and challenged cities to commit to broadening opportunities for local makers. Two years later, the National League of Cities released a report that I should put up, stating that 26% of U.S. cities had maker spaces in them and that there were an estimated 2,000 maker spaces around the world. In 2017, Make Magazine alone hosted over 200 official maker fairs around the world. And just this year, Merriam Webster added the word makerspace to their dictionary. Very cool. Thinking about benefits, thinking about the benefits that we talked about before, um, it's easy to see why makerspaces are successful. From a city standpoint or a civic standpoint, makerspaces provide opportunities for local innovation, education, and even maker driven tax revenue. From a popular standpoint, makerspaces provide a wide variety of instruction, access to an inclusive community, and a plethora of neat tools to experiment with. Um, at North End Makers, we want to keep this momentum going. Our goal is to provide a place where people can design, build, and manufacture just about anything, and most importantly, participate in an inclusive community of collaboration and mutual benefit. Um, we're going to talk more about makerspace communities in a bit. But uh, 
I think now we're going to talk about everyone's favorite tool, the 3D printer. <laughs> it's only my favorite tool when it works. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are actually two kinds of, of 3D printers that you commonly see in households or maker spaces now. Um, the first one I'll talk about is uh, the FDM printer, which is probably what you think of, what's the kind of printer you think of when you hear about 3D printer. Um, it's definitely the most common one out there right now, although that is changing. Um, FDM stands for fused deposition modeling. Uh, basically, it's kind of like a glue gun on a computer controlled rail system. Um, plastic filament goes in, it gets heated up and melted, and then it gets squeezed out line by line, layer by layer to create um, a, a hard piece of plastic. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of filaments. There's all different kinds of colors. Uh, there's filament that has wood in it. There's filament that has carbon fiber in it. There's conductive filament. Um, there's some filament that's flexible and rubbery. So there's all different kinds of filament that you can put into it. Um, you can do prints that are multiple colors and the material is cheap. I mean, we are talking like pennies per foot. So it's a low cost um, manufacturing. Um, some of the cons are it's low resolution and low accuracy and prints take a long time. It's pretty slow. Andrew, you wanna, there we go. Um, these are some of the things that people are making with 3D printers that are pretty exciting. Um, people discovered that they could make prosthetics with uh, 3D printers and obviously, you know, Prosthetics that are meant to be worn, especially on legs and lower limbs and by adults, would need to be made by 3D printers that are uh, much more professional level than what you have at home or a maker space. But the prosthetic hands on the right that you see there were made on a 3D printer that you can find at a, a, a maker space or that we I have here at home. Um, kids who need prosthetics frequently um, can't get them updated as often, they grow so quickly, and these prosthetics cost tens of thousands of dollars when they get them through um, a doctor's office, and they discovered that they can be 3D printed, um, so that's super exciting, and not only uh, is it much more affordable and customized to them, but they can get hands that look like superhero hands or robot hands or something that makes them feel, you know, extra cool. So I, that I think is really cool, a use of the 3D printing technology. Um, aside from prosthetics, there's also a lot of people, home people who are into home robotics or drone hobby use 3D printers to create pieces for their robots. The little green and white one on the right was the first robot I made. Um, so that's a fun application and um, Another application, uh, this is actually a printing press. This is a tiny printing press. It's just like maybe six inches long, um, but you can do, it can do any kind of printing that a full press can do. You can do intaglio printing, relief printmaking on it. Um, and this has brought printmaking into schools and homes. Whereas before, if you wanted to do printmaking, you needed access to a large expensive press. Um, and once you have a 3D printer, it's easy to, if you need a part, you need a fastener, you need a hinge, you just measure your, your piece and create it in your CAD program, and then you print it out. Um, at home, I've printed uh, adapters for my dust collection system in the shed to, to fit on tools. Um, here you see some game tokens that one of our makers printed for his uh, board game collection. So it's just a versatile tool where you can quickly kind of make anything that you have an idea to make. And you can see in this slide that there's some multicolor prints and you do that just by changing um, the filament uh, while it's printing. You pause the print and then you change the filament. And now uh, if we can switch over to my camera view, instead of the slideshow, I'm gonna show you all the 3D printer that I have here at home. Uh, this is an Ender 3. Can you guys see that? Uh, and you'll need to uh, pin Emily now. Or spotlight. Yeah, or unpin you or something, let's see. 
I got to find them, Lee. What? Where'd she? No, go? sorry, I have no, I have no pinning power. <laughs> I, just, I can't even find you right now. Where did you go? Um, if you go okay. click participants, you'll be able to see everyone's yeah. lifters with the yellow icon. Can I, I need to unpin? No. Come on, what's going on here? <laughs> participants. Oh, let's see. I should be. Uh, there we go. Uh, more and add spotlight, replace spotlight. There's not, uh, let's see, add spotlight. Here are that, that. Uh, I think I need to unpin. Yeah, you have to stop spotlighting Andrew. Right, that's what I'm trying to figure out how to do, yeah. Or remove spotlight, there we go. Okay. There we go. Okay, and so this is my little 3D printer. It's an Ender 3, it's fairly low cost printer. I think it, well, it's probably about $200 when we got it. I don't know what they go for now because we've had this a few um, years. But, um, sorry, hang on. Our door is going to get squeaky here for a minute. <laughs> My son's leaving. All right, so here's a 3D printer. It works with, this is a spool of uh, filament, of plastic filament. I'll take this off and you can kind of see it. Um, this is black. It's not a very fun um, color, but it's just a spool of plastic thread basically that comes down it comes into an extruder here which has gears that pull it into this uh tube it's called a Bowden tube and then there's a this is the hot part if it were on i would not be touching that um inside there it melts it and then if you can see there's a little nozzle down here that squeezes it out and lays it down on the bed um, so it's pretty simple and uh, filament comes in all different colors. We have red, we have green, we have like more filament than, than we probably need. <laughs> so, um, so that's, uh, that's the FDM printer. Um, it's a pretty simple machine, but um, they're finicky. You tinker with them a lot. And that's why I said, I love it when it works and I don't love it so much when it doesn't work. You have to make sure that the bed is level. Um, you, the nozzle tends to get clogged uh, frequently if you um, aren't printing at the right temperature for your filament and each brand of filament might need a slightly different temperature to stay moving. And uh, so it can, be, it can be finicky, but when it works, well, it works great. Uh, does anybody have any questions about this kind of printer? Before I talk about the other kind of printer. Uh, Emily, perhaps you could mention that there's just a wide variety of these things available at all levels. Or maybe you're getting into that, but- um, At all, all price points? Of these printers. This is true. Well, I mean, they're all, all the, FDM ones are basically like this, but yeah, as terms of like range of quality, this is on the low end for sure. Although the low end ones are pretty nice now. I mean, technology has really moved, that moved quickly on this. I mean, now I think they've probably gotten, I mean, there'll probably be some improvements, but I think it's kind of gotten as good as it's going to get, but there are definitely machines who, that, uh, you know, are a lot more accurate because the parts of the machine are much better and more expensive. Um, you can get, you can get different size nozzles so that it'll print out a thicker or thinner line of plastic, which will, um, you know, the thinner the line, the higher the resolution of your piece, the thicker the line, the faster it will print um, at a trade-off of, of resolution. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there are certainly machines that cost thousands of dollars that do that are fdm printers um but there are other kinds of 3d printers there's resin printers which i'm going to show you in a minute and then there's also powder printers which that's not the official name i can't remember what that kind is called it uses lasers and a powder um laser sintering Yes, that's the word I was looking for. And those printers cost like over a hundred thousand dollars. We're not going to have one at our makerspace, <laughs> but um, but I have gotten to see them work, and they're they're pretty cool. Um, but the parts that came off of them, I mean, I'm sure I only saw one machine work, and I, I don't know how professional the guys who were running it were. 
but the parts that came off of it were really um, fragile. Like they just kept breaking. So I don't know if that's inherent in that technology or, or not, because I really don't know much about that technology. If I can just uh, jump in for a minute, I've had some stuff made professionally with that technology and it's not at oh, all Oh yeah, fragile. do. Uh, oh good. So uh, they may not know what they're doing or they're making thin pieces or something, but I have some stuff that I've been knocking around for years um, again, me professionally, um, that just, you know, looks great and is very solid. That's awesome. So do you know any more about that technology? Cause I don't really know much about it. I do know that it lasers somehow melt the powder. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't really know that, that much. I, I, when I needed something, I just hired a company to do it for me. So um, right. I, I'm no expert on this. There was a brief makerspace in Shoreline or they called themselves the makerspace, but it was more of a print service that had a few of those powder printers. Mm -hmm. So that's where I saw it. Um, and like I said, I don't know how much they knew what they were doing. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start my video again and show you guys the resin, the other kind of 3D printer, which is rapidly gaining popularity in the consumer market. Oh, and this is an SLA printer. Um, or a resin printer. Uh, these used to be out of the price range of most homemakers, but they've really come down. Um, this is an Elegoo Mars. It costs a little over $200 wow. and it prints with UV resin um, and it's cured by a UV um, lights that is shining up under the bed. Um, I will try to show it a little closer I'm highly reactive to UV resin, so I'm not gonna take off the lid. Um, but if I get in here, it's printing now and you can see maybe, okay, that um, platform is moving up and down slowly. So when it moves down, there's a UV light underneath there. It's in a vat of liquid resin right now. And the light comes on and it cures that layer and then it moves up and um, moves down again and then cures the next layer. And so in that way, it builds uh, a resin print. And resin prints are, you get a lot more detail. You get some crazy fine detail. Um, oh, Andrew, can you put the slideshow back up really quick? Sure, yeah. Because I forgot to show, it'll be a lot easier to see the pictures me than me showing there. anything I've 3D printed. Um, but the detail on these is amazing. Um, they are uh, faster. Some, well, I think that technically the FDM printers are faster, but this seems faster. I don't know. Um, so I may have incorrect uh, information there. The materials are definitely more expensive than the FDM. Resin is pretty pricey. Um, and then if you move to the next one, you'll see the kind of detail. So that was printed on a resin printer. Um, that's a crazy amount of detail. You could never get that kind of detail on a FDM printer. Uh, parts are a lot more accurate too. So if you need something that fits well, like a gear, uh, especially a small gear, then resin printing is gonna work better for you. Um, people use them to cast, like cast jewelry or cast, uh, parts in mold making. Um, the, that's a dice that I printed and then I polish it up. So you can see that resin will polish to a really nice finish. Um, and then Andrew, if you go back a couple, there are even um, companies, Gillette is using resin printed handles on their razors uh, directly into the consumer market. So there are a lot of applications for resin printing. And it's pretty exciting that this is, um, that this is now available at the consumer, at the consumer level. So uh, does anybody have any questions about resin printing? I, I'm new to it, so I don't have a lot of um, knowledge about resin printing, but I can try to, to answer you. I just wanna say, um, 
something I love about resin printing is because of the way it works, rather than layering little pieces of plastic on top of each other from a single head that needs to be pretty precise and not move around a lot. Um, resin printers, you can print a whole bunch of things so long as they all fit on the pad at the same time. I love playing Dungeons and Dragons, um, and you can print a whole army of skeletons with a single resin print, which is pretty amazing compared to a PLA print or a plastic um, print, which would not nearly give you that level of control or detail, um, and you would not be able to print, you know, eight at a time or whatever. Yeah, it does have to be um, post-processed. Once you pull it out of that vat, the inside is cured, but the outside is going to be covered in uncured resin. So it has to be washed off in an alcohol bath and um, cured under UV light. The, um, so $200 for a home resin machine is astounding. Um, do you know what kind of resolution do you get on that or repeatability is... I mean, that's um, pretty amazing. I want to say we're printing right now with a layer of 0. 0.05 millimeters, I think. 0. Um, 0.05, wow. And that's not even as low as this goes. So um, that's pretty cool. That information is out there. I don't know it off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. I had no idea they got so cheap. They're crazy cheap. I mean, <laughs> but you know, like, uh, let me start my video again. A bottle, oh. which is, you know, about this much, yeah. is about 35 bucks. Yeah, so not, yeah. So it's You're, definitely not. It's um, like printer ink. That's how they make their money. Yeah. <laughs> and it's messy. I mean, you will go through gloves, and um, we have this down to protect our desk. This is our curing station. It washes and cures the parts um, in alcohol. And then this is a bank of UV lights. But, um, and some people are highly, you can't really work with a resin printer without um, protective gear. So you have to wear this VOC um, NIOSH respirator when you're working with it. Um, it may not, it doesn't bother most people or it doesn't bother them a lot. But sadly, I discovered when we got this that I'm highly sensitive to resin. So I can't really be around it very long without a respirator, without getting a serious headache and my face starts burning. So, so that part is not fun. <laughs> what was that brand again that, uh, that you're using? Uh, this is the Elegoo Mars. What was it again? Elegoo, E-L-E-G-O-O. E -L -E Mars. E uh, okay, I got Mars. Okay, I'll put and that in the. Uh, and one chat. other, I think the any cubic, any cubic photon is another that's in the same price range, and they're very similar um, in terms of quality and what they do, etc. Um, but this is really exciting. I mean, the things that you can make on this are really cool. Okay, Andrew, I've uh, lost my lost my notes for the presentation. So you need to talk while I find those. You guys be addressing the software side of 3D printing, what's involved with? Oh, um, I can talk about that a little bit right now. Um, I don't have it up on screen, but files, because they are printed layer by layer, um, files have to be sliced before they're sent to the printer. So um, there's slicing software that's out there. And um, so you bring in a file, usually it's an STL, which is, I think, stereo lithographic file. I'm not sure what that stands for. Um, but you've modeled in AutoCAD or um, Fusion 360 or Tinkercad or wherever, um, or purchased your mini off the internet. <laughs> And you bring it into this software and it'll slice it into layers depending on the resolution you've chosen, uh, what the material is. And then you'll have to pick supports, especially for resin printing or, well, for FDM printing too, because these printers can't print in thin air. So if there's any sort of overhang, you're gonna have to print supports that go from the printer bed to the overhang so that, um, so that they're not trying to print in thin air. 
Uh, but you set that up in the software and then it puts out G code and you and the machines read G code, which is what the laser reads. So that's a very common language for machines like this. And you're designing this using some kind of 3D soft, uh, software? Yeah, well, I'm just getting into 3D. Well, I, most of the designs I've done for my FDM printer, I've done in either Tinkercad, which is, I guess it's aimed at kids, but it's actually um, a pretty robust little program, 3D CAD program for simple things. Um, so when I need to design like a bracket or an adapter for a hose, I just go to Tinkercad because it's so easy. And then I'm trying to learn Fusion 360, which is a free version, a free CAD program. And I'm also trying to learn uh, Blender, which is, um, I can't remember the word for it. It's for more organic shapes. Um, and that would be more for, for me at least, for printing on the resin printer. Um, not that I couldn't print the other things like brackets and stuff on the resin printer. I just don't feel like I would need to. I, for what my, I'm gonna use it for the FDM printers fine for that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, you'd use some sort of 3D modeling program to make your files. And I don't know if you'll be talking about this, but will this kind of stuff you plan on having in your maker space along with people who can help make it all work? Definitely the FDM printers. And I know that there's a lot of people that want us to have resin printers, um, and including me. But um, since I got one at home and I've discovered how sensitive I am or really anybody could be, I mean, anybody could be that sensitive to it and you can become sensitive to it like the more often you're around it the more likely you are to develop a sensitivity to it um so we need to make sure that we can have that in a safe and well ventilated space <laughs> that would be the only caveat for I not we're going to end up with one of those you know when you can go to a place and touch a moon rock through like a container using the big gloves that are attached to the glass i think that's how we're going to do it Maybe. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> that might be overkill, but we would definitely want ventilation. And we're still playing with different things here at home to try to make it not so bad for me. Um, we have a couple of little carbon filters coming that will actually fit inside the printer that hopefully will clean some of those fumes. Um, because it's not too bad when it's running and enclosed. I can be up here. My nose is a little twitchy. Um, but when you open that printer to take the piece out, I can be downstairs and I will have a reaction. So <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, thing, it's the fumes. It's, I mean, you can get sensitive to touching the resin too and get like a rash or a, even a burn, but um, the fumes are pretty, pretty nasty. As far as I know, they're mostly an irritant though. It's not like they're, um, I don't think they're super bad unless you were like working with it on an industrial level. Thank you. I'll, leave. <laughs> I'll let, you, let you continue now. Okay, cool. Um, so we've um, introduced making and told you a bit about makerspaces. Um, right now, we'd like to touch on the ecosystem of makerspaces, basically the communities which make them up and their effects on the places that they inhabit. Um, hobbyist communities are not a new thing by any stretch especially to those of us in the tech sector many information age products that we're all very familiar with started in homebrew electronics groups or quote unquote someone's garage is the story you hear from the 70s 80s 90s maker communities are a natural evolution of this and improve on the model of hobbyist groups a bit by bringing many disciplines to the same place and creating a space where they can hang out together and share tools and ideas I think Emily has a really great story about this. <laughs> yeah, I do. One of the the one of my most favorite like maker stories is um, I was at a maker chat. We met at like a Panera Bread, and um, it was a, all kinds of people. We you know posted on meetup, so it was whoever showed up. Um, and at one point, I overheard this like middle aged engineer guy, and he was talking about a problem with a robot that he was trying to build, um, and he was designing. And uh, one of the other people who was there was a high school girl who loved insects. Like that was her thing. She gave talks on insects to schoolmates and stuff. And she overheard him 
And so she began telling him about how the wings worked and how they folded into the thorax of some bug that she knew about. Um, and by the end of this conversation, he was like, I think you've solved my problem. And, and it was just so cool to see this like middle-aged engineer guy talking to a 14 year old girl, high school student about solving a problem. And they like maybe came up with a solution together. And I don't think that that's something you would see too often outside of a maker community, you know, like that. Um, and so that was really cool. Um, and stories like this are, are kind of the norm from our own experiences. Um, and successful maker communities are often very inclusive and usually centered around a philosophy of open innovation rather than you may have heard closed innovation in the tech circles. Um, the idea is that collaboration and the acceptance of outside ideas results in better outcomes. Uh, possibly because of this, makerspaces tend to maintain way better demographic representation than the steam industry as a whole. Um, you can see on screen uh, that there's a really well-rounded um, representation of people the last time that there was a major survey of maker youths. Um, compared to a similar survey I found on um, industry showed a massive decline in female involvement and a massive decline in non-white involvement um, among the tech sector. So it's really cool. That is cool. Um, and I think we see that a lot here in the Pacific Northwest too. Um, over the years, we've been home to like garment manufacturers, shipwrights, food products, logistic companies, aviation and aerospace, of course, um, and our booming tech sector. Um, the Puget Sound region, um, more and more mass manufacturers or manufacturing is being automated and outsourced. Our region has seen many people take small scale manufacturing into their own hands and create a unique and customizable items. Um, and it feels really nice to buy those items. I have a shirt that was made in the Pacific Northwest and I wear it like every week because I just love that it was made up here, all the pieces of it, not manufactured overseas somewhere. Um, it gives me kind of warm fuzzies and I love that our hobby helps people create more of these local products. Making and makerspaces improve local markets like ours, like, like Seattle's and it's not just Emily and I blowing happy feelings at you. Um, they've done economic value studies of the maker movement and they've been very positive. One study, the economic value of one maker hotspot, the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York, was estimated at $1.93 billion. And it was also credited with the creation of over 10,000 jobs. And our own sister city of Portland, um, the local maker economy has had significant impact as well. Estimates from 2015 say 120 manufacturers have created roughly 1,000 jobs, resulting in $270 million in local manufacturing revenue. And that's a global phenomena. Uh, with the rise of crowdfunding and e-commerce, anyone with an internet connection can also be an international entrepreneur without needing to own a large supply chain or fulfillment company. Um, while it can be difficult to get reliable and relevant data, extrapolating just from Etsy, Kickstarter, and Amazon Launchpad sales, maker-driven businesses account for billions of dollars of annual global online revenue. Um, and not to mention, you've just heard so many stories this last year of mask makers and Etsy sales helping people make it through this difficult year. Oh, spoilers for the next bit, but uh, <laughs> it is really exciting. Um, for those of you that want a deeper dive on some of these metrics I'm throwing at you, um, at the end of this, I'll be posting a link to the presentation in the chat on Meetup. Um, and um, it will also include at the bottom some of our sources and some further reading if you're excited by this and want to learn more. For now, uh, Emily's going to show us another neat tool uh, called a laser cutter. CNC lasers. Um, I think that's the biggest tool that people think, that's the first tool people think about when they think about uh, makerspaces. I know that was the question we got at our old makerspace is, um, do you have a laser cutter? When, how do I get to use the laser cutter? Um, they are fun. Uh, laser cutters can cut acrylic, they can cut wood, plywood, and thin uh, hardwoods. Uh, they can cut some leathers, veg stand leather. Uh, they can cut cardboard, paper, and even cloth. Um, and then they don't just cut. You can engrave with a laser cutter. They can engra also engrave on acrylic, wood, paper. You can even engrave on cloth. 
fleece. If you put a piece of fleece into a laser, it engraves really well and it doesn't degrade the material. It just takes off the top like fuzzies so that you can see the design that's been engraved on it. Velvet also engraves really well. Um, you can engrave on glass and you can engrave on treated metal with a CO2 laser, which is what uh, I have. It's what the Makerspace will have. There are of course other lasers um, that are far more expensive that can cut metal um, a glass, we don't have one of those. And I don't really know too much about those. Um, and there are also um, diode lasers, which you're seeing a lot of in people's homes that can't cut a lot of materials. They can do some nice um, uh, engraving though. And maybe some of the more powerful ones can cut material. I'm not too familiar with it. Uh, anyway, I mentioned I was an Etsy store uh, owner, these are some of the things I've made. The little monsters are made out of layers of laser cut um, plywood. And the coasters are also made of plywood. Um, boxes, people, laser cutters are awesome for making boxes and enclosures, organization tools. Um, I've organized and made organizers for my kitchen drawer, for my wood shop. Well, um, my, my kitchen silverware rests in boxes that you made that perfectly fit my drawer. Exactly. You can custom customize what you're making to exactly what you want. Um, so that's really fun. And you can also put some artistry into it just by layering things or engraving. Okay, next slide. Um, more boxes. My daughter, the one on the lower right, my daughter wanted to make a present for her friends. So we made her a laser cut box with her name cut out and glued on it and painted. And that was really cool. It's, I don't know if you can see it on the picture, but it has a living hinge on it, which is where you laser cut a pattern into the wood that makes it so that you can bend it like a, like a book spine. Um, so that's pretty cool. You can make curved pieces with that. And then the box on the left is my um, electronic uh, D20 that I made. And the box is laser cut out of wood. The, um, acrylic material for the top of it is laser cut and laser engraved. All of the holes for the screws and the buttons um, are laser engraved. Parts that you can't see are, are also have laser engraved spots for various um, switches and electronics and the charger can fit in through the back. So that was cool to be able to custom make that exactly how I wanted it. Um, you can laser engrave on leather. The journal was laser engraved and then um, stained. And then the um, colorful crown there is laser cut acrylic on a ring of neopixels. So laser uh, acrylic, when it's laser cut like that, really picks up light. So you see laser cut acrylic used in um, neopixel projects a lot. And I think, oh, and then another use that I use my laser for all the time is my daughter also makes soap. She sells soap to raise money for a trip that she's taking. So I laser engraved um, a design. It was a Ouija board that she wanted. And then I put it in a box and I poured liquid, you know, silicone over it to make the mold. And then on the right is the soap that came out of that. So there are some, you know, practical uses for a laser. You can cut there's, I mean, obviously there's practical uses for a laser, but there are so many uses for a laser. Um, I mean, I use it in so many different ways. And I think that's all the slides on the laser and then I'm gonna show you my laser. So let me, okay, so this is my laser. It is a full spectrum hobby laser. It's a 40 watt um, CO2 laser. It is connected to a laptop here via ethernet. And um, sorry, my space is a mess. Uh, here is, is my power strip. I'm not going to turn it on yet because it's going to get um, loud. But uh, we'll show you. In here is the, this is the laser tube. Um, but whoops, the laser's in here. And then water has to go in here to keep it cool. So underneath here is a bucket of water. Kind of hard to see. There's a bucket of water that has an aquarium pump in there. And on the floor way back there in the corner is an air pump or a compressor that blows air out of the, right by the where the laser comes out to keep smoke from getting in the laser beam. So I'm gonna fire this up. 
and I have it connected so that one switch turns on everything. And I thought I would just, oh, my computer's turning off. So this is, the laser comes out down here and it bounces off a mirror here. And then it hits a mirror that's on this gantry. And it goes over here and hits another mirror here. And then it goes down through this lens, which focuses the laser and comes out down here. Um, the distance from here to the material that I'm cutting is how it's focused. So this laser needs a, I think this is 20, I don't know what the 2.0 is because that's more than 20 millimeters. So I put that under there and then I loosen this and I make sure it's just sitting right on top of that and then I tighten it up. And now theoretically my laser is focused. This is a focusing beam. So when I close this and go over to my computer, I have a file over here. I just create my files in, um, I use Inkscape, but you can use Illustrator or Fusion 360 or probably AutoCAD. Um, anything that will output as SVG or a DXF file. So I have, um, in Inkscape, it just works like a printer. I just choose file print and I choose my laser from the list there, just full, full spectrum driver. And then the laser software opens and here's where I set my settings and I can choose uh, the raster is the engraving settings and the vector is the cut settings. So um, I can choose how dark or how light I want the engraving to be by adjusting the raster power and speed and cutting i can choose different cut speeds and power for different colors um red or black is what i have in this file um you can also do vector scoring uh, so if i just wanted to have a thin engraved line it would be a lot faster to use a vector line um, a vector line that didn't cut all the way through than it, rather than engraving um, and I can set these, like over here, I'm gonna set the black to go zero times because I don't want it to cut that. But, and jump in if you have any questions because I might, I'm just sort of going over this. I'm gonna start this file. I'm gonna show you how I can, um, oh, it's not connected to the laser. I have to connect first. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me questions while I'm setting this up. I'm just gonna home my laser first. It needs to know where it is in the bed. So you have to home it first. So it goes up to the upper right. And now it's home and the software says, okay, you, we know where you are. And um, then I move it back to where I want it to start. As you can see, I use that all the little scraps of wood. <laughs> and I can check to see if it's going to fit. Can you turn the camera a bit to the left? Sorry? There you go. Thank you. OK. I can do a perimeter check to make sure it's going to fit. And it looks like it's gonna, not quite fitting there. So now it will fit. And I can choose start. And it will start um, engraving. So. Engraving can take a while, and then the vector cutting is pretty, pretty quick. So that is my laser, and I love it. It's probably my favorite thing in the house. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about that? I'm going to tell your son you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now Glowforge is a, is a local company. It's, have you thought about approaching them for a donation for a local makerspace? We or actually have. We have a member who has one and is donating it, who's committed to donating it when the uh, place opens. Cool. It's very yeah. exciting. Glowforges the, are very nice. Yeah, so Glowforge does more than just laser cutting and engraving because it does scanning and, well, maybe you can tell us even you know, what it does because it does a, um, it's From bind various things into one machine. I'm not quite sure how what. 
from what I understand, I mean, it is basically still just a laser cutter, but it does have a, the software in, is pretty sophisticated and it has a camera inside there. And so it, the camera can just, could show you what it's engraving while it's doing it. Um, but it can also uh, take a scan of like, if you drew a picture and you put it into the laser bed, it would um, take a scan of it and basically import it into that laser software for you. Um, and so it would take out the step of me having to, if I drew a picture that I wanted to engrave, um, scanning that image, taking it into Illustrator or Inkscape and, and converting it into an SVG file that the laser could read. So it sort of just does all of that for you, which is pretty cool. Thank you, yeah. Um, very cool, neat toys. Yeah. These are, not, these are not cheap machines though, right? <laughs> uh, this is not a high-end laser. I think that it's, I mean, I mean, your definition of high-end definitely <laughs> um, varies from person to person. I think that if, I, if you bought this new, well, first of all, it's an old laser. I don't even think they sell it anymore, but probably around 2,500. And you yeah. have to set up a significant um, dust mitigation system or a fume mitigation system. Oh, yeah, I'll show you my lovely fume. It does put out some stinky fumes. Acrylic smells terrible. Leather smells even worse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'd mentioned there's a fan that's blowing air in there that keeps the smoke circulating. There's also, you probably can't see it, but there's a hole back there behind the laser. You can kind of see the laser firing now. Um, anyway, back here is a, a vent, and here's my ventilation hose goes up and over <laughs> and out my window. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> what about how dangerous is the laser? I mean, you want to keep this away from kids, or? Um, this laser has a safety feature, and I'm sure the Glowforge does too. Um, where if I lift this lid, it has a limit switch on it. So as soon as that limit switch is disengaged, the laser powers off. Um, so, so it's fairly safe unless that was just, that was broken or something to some degree. Um, okay. I'd be can more you, concerned about the tool around kids. <laughs> can you, um, cut food? Could you cut or engrave chocolate with this or would it just melt? You know, I don't know if you could cut chocolate. I mean, I imagine it would melt. I know I have seen, uh, people like toast marshmallows or make little like Toasted designs on marshmallows or toast. Oh, uh, that's bread. brilliant! Um, I want to try that. <laughs> I, I haven't tried it yet. I don't think I eat anything that had been inside this laser, though. I mean, it's fairly. Oh yeah, the I, dust. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I cleaned it recently, but I'd still think that, like, I don't know. Just yeah, I could do <laughs> one like bite. <laughs> I swear, okay. I've seen someone do. Um, like pork skin or ham in one of these two, which cannot have smelled good. <laughs> oh, it already finished engraving. So now I'll go ahead and switch it to vector. Or we can stop looking at my laser and go on to the next section. <laughs> it's hard call. <laughs> and this laser cover is has some sort of coating that like you can look at it without it hurting your eyes. Although sometimes some materials, it gets really bright and I wouldn't stare at it. Yeah. It can be dangerous. You have to focus the laser with the lid open. So that can be a little scary sometimes. My son actually got his hand in a laser beam once um, and scared me to death. He was helping build a laser, which is why I kind of cringe every time I hear about um, made lasers, I get a little squeamish. Um, yeah, because he was helping <laughs> build one, and you can't see the laser beam. I mean, you know, it's invisible, and you know, just one second his hand moved to the wrong spot, and he the edge of his hand got in the laser beam. And um, I mean, luckily, it was barely anything, it was just the edge of his hand, and it was just a you know, pretty nasty burn, it was very small. Um, but uh, you know, it could have been really bad. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's also worth and, mentioning and worse that. Is, and worse is your eyes because you can drive without even knowing it. 
Um, so you really do have to be very careful around lasers. Lasers and some obvious you come out of little DVD players or DVD writers, and those can blind you from a reflection faster than you can blink. Yes, yeah, you have to not put anything mirrored in here either. Yeah, if you're pulling the blue blue um, lasers out of a blue ray, then you either better know what you're doing or you're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> they, are, they can be really dangerous. They're pretty cool though. You can pop a balloon from about like I don't yeah. know. 500 feet away. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, yeah, and you can overpower them and stuff. They're really dangerous. Yeah. It's definitely worth mentioning that playing with lasers is something you should do at your own risk. Um, let's move on. Um, we're going to start winding down. And um, we thought it might be fun to showcase some recent examples of how the maker movement has helped the world. Um, the first example is a group called Tikkun Alama Maker or TOM. Tom is a nonprofit that brings together makers and people with disability to co-design assistive technologies for them. They host makeathons, and at them they've created prototypes for solutions that allow people with disability disabilities to get in and out of wheelchairs, open doors, grab and carry objects, and even go kayaking or surfing. Their ultimate goal is to improve the lives of 250 million people through these makeathons that they host. Uh and another story, uh, it's a little older, but it's still pretty wonderful. In 2010, a team of 15 teens from a low-income school in West Philadelphia competed in the Automotive X Prize, and they built a, a fuel-efficient hybrid car that outperformed other hybrids built by professional engineers and graduate students from top universities. Um, in a region with a dropout rate of over 50%, every single member of the team graduated. Inspired in part by that experience, the teacher who led the team has now launched an entire public school focused on student learning through solving hands-on real-world problems. And I'm pretty sure they made a movie about that, but I can't find the name of the movie. Um, and finally, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about last year um, when COVID-19 began to surge across the world. Uh, makers global and locally worked all hours of the day to help others. These kind people designed, produced, and distributed countless masks, face shields, and ventilators to organizations in dire need. In several cases, makers went one step further and helped hospitals and care facilities develop workarounds to bespoke medical hardware that were unable to be replaced due to world supply shortages. A lot of these hot fixes had to be made on site and in periods of just a few hours to preserve as many lives as possible. Um, I'm sure many of you know someone who's involved in one of these efforts. Um, we had many makers that were just churning out masks all hours of the day because as you as you all know, it was impossible to get our hands on them. Yeah, and there are many more stories like these. Aspiring entrepreneurs and affected individuals often overcome societal problems and oversights that are too niche, too difficult, or perhaps unprofitable, most likely, um, to address otherwise. A maker community is the natural home for these efforts, and we hope we've demonstrated a bit why we think that's true. Uh, we're coming to the end of our talk. But before we get there, let's take a look at a very small subset of more tools you can expect to find and learn about and use at your local makerspace. We'll probably have to uh, do a spotlight swap again. Ken, are you able to? Look at that. So these are just a few tools out of my workshop. Um, and I do I want need to. <laughs> right. I do mean just a few. My wife um, is very kind and patient with me and my tool budget. Um, but we really try to highlight uh, all sorts of disciplines when we're talking about maker spaces. Um, I'm obviously very into woodworking and I do a lot of um, auto work as well. Um, so there's a lot of that represented here. But as you move on, um, makerspaces focus a lot on cooking and creativity and art through food. Um, there's painting, there's sewing, there's vinyl cutting, um, there's electronics. There's really any kind of discipline you can think of where you can express yourself in a way that is creative or that solves a problem. Um, you can find utilized at a makerspace and you can find tools to do at a makerspace. Um, if anyone has questions about particular maker tools or disciplines, now is a great time to ask them. Um, otherwise, we'll start wrapping up. Um, could you talk about what the status is of the North End 
um, makerspace um, and what you expect to actually have in your space and when and how people can get involved, please. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, we hope to be opening in the next, I want to say next few months. It really depends on how quickly people are able to get vaccinated on a large scale. Um, ultimately, safety is a massive priority for everyone on our team. Um, we are currently looking in the Shoreline Edmonds kind of area um, in order to have a space large enough to have at the very least um, a common area with some basic stuff like an electronics workshop and maybe kind of like a sewing fabric station. Um, and then a room for a wood shop where we could contain dust and then another room for sort of louder, more sensitive things like 3D printers and um, laser, laser cutters. Cutter. Yeah, laser cutters for sure. Uh, we have a lot of people on board right now through our virtual makerspace community. Um, people who are experts in 3D printing, cooking, crafting, making things out of paper. Um, it's really an amazing group of people and I can't wait for us all to be together again. Many yeah. of us are part of an older makerspace that um, ultimately didn't, uh, didn't come to fruition. And we're all really excited about um, doing this one kind of more right, more business oriented, but still from a nonprofit perspective of using whatever ounce of energy and effort and finance we have, um, using that to help people who can't find access to these sort of tools in other ways or can't get training or maybe are uh, have difficulties or disabilities, finding ways to support them and getting them involved and giving them opportunities that they may not have um, otherwise. And how do you, how, uh, is, oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna ask if it's okay, if Andrew could maybe pop a link to our Discord in the chat, uh, yeah, yeah. if that's okay with you, Ken. Yeah, please do, any links you want. And of course we'll be, posting um, this and the recording on the meetup page uh, and any other comments, links to your, you know, to your site and so on. Um, we definitely want to make a, as much information available as possible. How is this funded or will there be fees and, and to use it and how does it, how does it work for the average person who wants to come in and Start yeah, I can answer that. Um, we are currently funded mostly through donations and classes that we teach. Um, we will be doing, we'll be obviously searching for as much free money, donations as possible for, through grants and through people that want to support our mission. We'll be teaching classes that are both sometimes free and sometimes um, costly based on the cost to us to host the class and whether we see it as an opportunity for um, a good way to make money, but we're not, we're not really out there to try and like charge hundred dollars for a class. We're out there to make five bucks a head on a class just so we can raise a little bit of money here and there so we can put on the next class. Um, ultimately, we do plan on charging people to use the space to be members. It's gonna be open 24 hours a day. People are gonna have access to big tools that require us to train them, that require us to maintain um, lots of security and lots of procedures in place. Um, we, we have to, be able to recuperate that cost some way. So we're gonna be charging people um, fees. Um, there's gonna be tiered memberships we're looking at, basically one where you can come and use the space occasionally, one where you wanna be there all the time, one where you're kind of more interested in getting time on 3D printers and using those materials. We're also looking to subsidize for people that uh, are unable to afford a makerspace, subsidize um, free and low cost memberships as well, so that people that can afford a makerspace and are you know, under no hardship to do it are actually paying for a little bit of someone who can't afford a makerspace, but has just the same right to be there as anyone else. Yeah, right now we're lucky to have a, a, a several board members who uh, work for companies who match their volunteer time with donations, uh, with you know money donations to us. Um, so we hope to hope to find more more volunteers like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Um, we just have a little bit more to say, and then we're we're pretty much done. 
So we'll definitely stay in touch and make sure that as you um, get towards opening up this space, um, we'll announce it on our meetup um, as well. Okay. And well, um, as I mentioned earlier on, um, um, I might be looking together, put together a group of people to build this um, uh, nitrogen laser. Um, since, oh. um, you know, it does involve some high voltages, it'd be nice to have some people who are comfortable around <laughs> high voltages are at least not quite as scared of them as I am. Uh, a, healthy, a healthy scare of them makes sense. But um, so... Um, we would love that. Um, Emily, do you want to start the outro? Just it, we, we talked about this and there's kind of a wonderful thing we wanted to leave you guys with um, before we went. If I can ask one more question before we do that. Um, do you know anything about what happened to the, the maker fairs and how that ended? That was something that I had participated in for a number of years and then they just um, stopped. Do you know anything yeah. about that? Uh, the uh, gentleman who founded Make, the magazine, um, ultimately admitted that while it had been very successful, it wasn't actually run from a business standpoint and that it hadn't been sort of managed properly. So he kind of folded the magazine and is some of you may know the magazine is now back being released after he kind of restructured the company maker fairs as part of that he i think he he said he was either stopping temporary or stopping permanently and that kind of happened not very long maybe a year emily correct me if i'm wrong before the pandemic started yeah, um, yeah. well i know the last of, one in seattle they had trouble finding participants i mean and it was really it sad was, yeah. <laughs> it was small right i had a booth there um, I do, um, um, whenever I get a chance, I do these bristle bots for kids. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, I think we met you then, because we were <laughs> really did. close. We were like five down from the bristle bot booth. Okay, yeah, could be, yeah. That was, um, I always enjoyed them. I also did them when I lived in another city, so it was very disappointing. I could tell that it was a much smaller yeah. thing, but I was hoping that was just a local problem, not, not you know, worldwide. Now, I hope they come back or at yeah. least another iteration of them comes back in some way. I mean, maybe once we get a space, we can get all the maker spaces together and have our own maker yeah. fair or something because they were wonderful. They really were. They're a lot of fun. And, and Maker Magazine, Make Magazine still does exist. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, um, and I recommend it for any of you out there in um, Zoom land. Um, Make Magazine does have a lot of really fun projects. Oh, that very approachable and doable. It was pretty obvious that they were not under good business sense when I canceled my subscription. Um, I think I was trying to re-up it or I got a free copy of it from someone else. And um, I ended up just receiving free magazines from them for like three years. <laughs> I, I, I kept receiving two copies because I couldn't cancel one. I wasn't paying for it anymore, but... And they were not part of O'Reilly. So at some point, I, I thought they were, but I guess they're not. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. I will. Um, hmm. So, Andrew, now. how do you start making? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I'll answer that. First, you come up with an idea. Um, and next time, like the next time you're troubled by something, just think about how you would change it. You know, if something doesn't quite work the way you want it or you think it could work better, think about how you would make that happen. Um, get excited about learning what you would need to do or need to know to follow through with that idea um, and find a community of people who can help you. Uh, there's meetup, there's social media, join a subreddit or a forum um, or a discord. <laughs> now discord seems to be taking over um, and then just keep trying. And when doesn't something work, ask questions and be willing to, to make mistakes. Um, failure is often celebrated in the maker movement because we, we won't learn without failing. Um, so try again and maybe succeed. So if that sounds exciting to you, try to visit a maker event or a maker space when it's safe. And, uh, uh, and then maybe you'll even teach a class or volunteer in an event someday. Is that me? Anyway, um, we hope that whatever your idea will is, it will be interesting. It will 
make you smile. It will help you meet new people. It will help others, or you know, we hope it will change your life. Uh, we hope we've inspired you guys today. Um, it's our pleasure and our privilege to be able to give talks like this. Um, thank you so much for your time, and feel free to ask any other questions you have of us through our Discord or through this Meetup page. We will 